You're listening to Feathers, a podcast of stories of women walking in faith. I hope these stories inspire you and encourage you to take flight in your own faith. I'm your host, Amy Bennett, and this is Season 6, Episode 13. Feathers is an outreach of Abiding Ministries. Find more encouragement at abidingministries.net. Hey guys, and welcome to Feathers This Week. This week we have Amy Peterson. Amy is a writer, an English as a second language instructor, and assistant director of honors programming at Taylor University in Upload, Indiana. She just released her first book, Dangerous Territory, My Misguided Quest to Save the World. And it's about her journey to be a missionary in Asia and the way it unexpectedly turned out. In this conversation, we talk about missions, we talk about persecuted believers, um, we talk about the struggles that we have as Christians with striving. Um, It's such a great conversation. I may have even cried a little on this one. So I'm looking forward um, to you hearing this conversation. So let's go ahead and get started with my conversation with Amy. Hey, Amy, and welcome to Feathers Today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're with me today. How about we start off You introduce yourself, your family, and what keeps you busy these days? Yeah, I love that you asked the question that way. What keeps you busy these days? Because so many, so many times when people ask that question of women in particular, they're like, what do you do? I know. I started asking that differently because I'm like, I mean, a lot of, you know, even stay at home moms, I'm like, well, you know, I don't really know how to ask that, but you know, we all stay busy with something. And, and even for me, somebody like me that works like in a full-time job, there's a lot of other things that keep me busy. I like to talk about. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I live in rural Indiana on two acres of farmland. Um, my husband and I moved here about seven years ago so that he could run the English as a second language program at Taylor university. And, Um, So he's still doing that, and I also work part-time at Taylor. I help direct the honors program, and I do a little bit of adjunct teaching. Um, And then we also have two kids. Uh, Rosemary is in second grade, and Owen is in kindergarten. So we stay pretty busy with all that, but then also I'm a writer, and so I spend a lot of time um, writing and I'm in a Master's of Fine Arts program in creative writing, so I'm also a student. So there are plenty of things keeping me busy. Oh, my goodness. We could just talk about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you guys have any uh, – obviously, you're staying busy, but do you guys have any fun summer plans on top of all that? Well – My husband is also a student. He's in a Ph.D. program. And for his Ph.D. program, he has to spend nine weeks um, in Pennsylvania away from us. Um, So he'll be in Pennsylvania doing Ph.D. coursework. And when he leaves, I like to leave, too, because I get too bored and sad and lonely without him. So the kids and I will be packing up the car and just going all over, actually. Um, We'll go visit my family in Arkansas. Um, my, my dad is speaking at a family camp and so we're going to go to family camp with my parents and then, yeah, we'll just be all around. It'll be a lot of fun. Oh my goodness. So that does seem like a whirlwind of a summer. So I have to ask about, um, family camp. That's like not a thing around my area. (laughs) And I actually think I heard Jamie Ivey talk about it one time. They were going to family camp. Is that like a thing that you grew up with? Uh, I grew up going to summer camp, like Christian summer camp, but not family camp. Um, but I do know there are a lot of family camps around where I grew up. Um, the first time, actually, the first time I went to family camp, I was in high school, maybe. Um, and my dad was the speaker at a family camp in Arkansas called New Life Ranch. And so we went to that, but I was kind of over it. Maybe I was actually in college. <laughs> I was a little old to be going to family camp. But yeah, it's a thing. So like the parents go listen to teaching um, and then the kids get to go off with their own age groups and do fun camp things. Um, so I think my kids will love it. I don't know. I hope. It seems like it would be really fun. You know, I miss youth camp you know I was in the youth group and we went to summer camp every summer Um, and it's some of my favorite memories as a teenager and I really miss it so I keep thinking like maybe I can take the whole entire family to family camp (laughs) just so you can get back to family camp yes (laughs) yeah you should do it find one that has a good ropes course and canoeing those are always my favorite parts 
Well, my mine was sailing. <laughs> what is about that? It's always mm-hmm. there's a lake nearby, right? So mine was we yeah. did a cat not a cat I think it was called a it wasn't a catamaran, it was something else, but like we it was basically sailing and we learned how to do that. And now that I think back I'm like us two little girls, we were like fourteen <laughs> um, trying to do that. We at uh, one time there was a storm coming up and we almost got stuck in the middle of the Stuck in the middle of the lake, which is kind of scary. But my my kids, I have I have three kids, and the two older ones are now in youth youth group. Um, so they're oh. going to camp actually in a couple of weeks. So I they might already be over the whole family camp idea. Yeah, that's a little late. It's hard. Family camp is cool. You know. Anyway, okay. Well, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's get into talking about. Um, the writing portion of your uh, busyness. Uh, you have a new book um, out called Dangerous Territory, and I enjoyed it so much. And so, well, thank you. Um, yeah, so really, just to set it up a little bit, you're uh, as a as a child, you actually uh, read a lot about missionaries and wanted to be a missionary, and uh, ended up doing that. I guess pre kids and pre husband and all of that. Yeah. And it actually turned out a lot different, I think in some ways than you thought and learned a lot of different things um, that I think will be uh, really helpful for the people that are listening. So I really would just, if you could share that story about um, where that all started and how it went. Yeah. Well, let me, before I tell actually the story, let me share a little bit about what you were referring to and sort of um, the way I grew up thinking about missionaries, because you know, as a child, I did read a lot of missionary biographies, people like Amy Carmichael and Hudson Taylor, um, Gladys Allward, and I found their stories to be really inspiring. You know, they were full of like high adventure and um, it just seemed that I'll start over because you probably heard my email ding there. I didn't hear it. It's OK. <laughs> oh, OK, good. Um they were full of high adventure and it seemed that uh, there were different ways for women to serve God. You know, I a wife and mom or a teacher or a nurse. Um, none of those things seemed very exciting to me when I was growing up. What did seem exciting to me was going to a foreign country and um, seeing new places and doing things no one else was doing um, and, and getting to do it all in the name of God was like an added bonus, right? I, I got to have the same kind of adventures that Nancy Drew was having, um, but I got to do it for like a spiritual holy purpose. So I was like really inspired by that. And I think it was reinforced too in sort of the the churches and the evangelical world I was growing up in because when pastors um, would preach about like living radical lives or um, being fully, you know, fully devoted to God, they didn't often hold up um, what, what they held up as an example of that was missionaries um, who were doing these heroic and unusual things. They didn't say, be fully devoted to God, attend professional development conferences in your field so you can stay up to date mm-hmm. or be fully devoted to God, sweep the floor every day. You know, like the, the parts of just living a faithful life um, in sort of a standard American uh, trajectory were not what people were saying it meant to be radical or fully devoted to God. Yeah, well, uh, I, think th- I think that's so true. I mean, I experienced that too, like the peak of all, you know, the precipice or whatever you will of Christianity was to go and be a missionary in a foreign field. Like that was just always absolutely. held up as the, as the big thing. Yeah, it was like there were two ways of, of serving God. You could be a normal Christian or you could be like a really good Christian and yep. be a missionary or maybe a pastor. And so, of course, if I was given a choice between being a normal Christian, super good Christian, I wanted to be the super good one. Right. Um, I even remember I went to this conference um, that was called One Day. And this was in like, what, 1999? Um 2000, something like that. And John Piper was speaking and he was talking about not wasting your life um, and not just like dreaming about retiring and collecting seashells on the beach. And as a counterexample, he talked about two women from his church who had moved to a country in Africa and spent their retirement years as missionaries there and then died one day when they were driving in their Jeep and the brakes gave out 
And he said they went soaring off the cliff into eternity. And I just remember picturing them and thinking, like, now that is an exciting life. <laughs> soaring off the cliff flying, into eternity for high. God. <laughs> right. Flying high. Yes. Feathers. Faith in flight. Yes. That's what I thought of. <laughs> um, yeah. So I definitely had this idea um, that I wanted to be one of heaven's heroes, like these missionaries. And um and so that was part of what motivated me to go overseas after college. Um, I was I was 22. I was graduating from college. Um, I went to a big state school in Texas and had a degree in English literature. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life at all. I thought about um, trying to work in publishing or going to grad school. And then I remembered that in high school, I had made a little promise to God on a youth group retreat that I would spend at least one year doing missions. And so I thought, well... I'll do that now <laughs> and I'll figure out what to do with my life later. I'll, I'll do some missions now. That will be exciting. That will be my adventure after college. Um, and, you know, t- to be clear, it wasn't all like this personal search for glory and adventure. I also had a really sincere desire just to serve God and, and to do what God wanted me to do, um, to share the love of God with those who, did not know it. Right. So I think I went with motivations, like a sincere desire to serve God, um, some actual fear about like living into what I knew had been a sort of capitalist and imperialist venture at certain points in history. And then also this like desire to really do big things for God and to be one of heaven's heroes. So that's where I was at age 22 when I decided to go overseas and, Um, In the book, I don't actually name the country where I went because of the things that happened while I was there. Um, It's a country in Southeast Asia where it is illegal to practice Christianity. And um, so I don't name the country as a way to try to protect my students and friends who are Christians who are still there. Um, But I so I signed up with this organization that sends Christian English teachers to closed countries, to countries where missionaries are typically not able to enter as just missionaries. And um, I started a graduate program where I studied about intercultural communication and theology. Um, and I was trained in teaching English as a second language. And I left for Southeast Asia. And I asked my support I was going um, to pray for me. Um, I was going to a small town, sort of a rural area that was devastated by a past war. And it was a town that um, my organization had had teachers in for two years. And those teachers were both coming back stateside now. And they told me that they didn't know of any Christians or any churches in the area and that they had really seen no spiritual interest during the two years they had been there. So the organization kind of warned me, like, this place is hard soil. It's it's a dark place. There's not a lot of spiritual interest. Don't expect to see anything happen. Um, they said typically it took at least three years of presence in a city before they started to see any spiritual interest developing. So, so I started, let me let me just yeah, ask the question. So just to just to clarify a little bit, like the organization you were with and your intent was at the core around the gospel, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a Christian organization. Um, I was I was going as a Christian English teacher, and so the country knew that I was a Christian, um, and they knew I was an English teacher. They really wanted English teachers, but my goal really was to go be sort of like a Christian presence, offering a needed service in this country. Um, and and I asked my supporters to pray that over my first year that there that I would find two or three young women that I could disciple in the faith. Now, I didn't really expect that that would happen because, you know, I had been warned that this was not a place where we knew of any Christians or where anybody had shown any interest. Um, but I thought, well, I should ask my supporters to pray for this, so I will ask them to. And um, then things started to get interesting. After I had been teaching for about a month, um, one of my colleagues, a local teacher, was pregnant and she fell and had to be put on bed rest for the remainder of her pregnancy. So the university asked me if I would take over one of her classes. And I did. 
And in that class was a young woman who in the book I call Veronica. Veronica came to visit me um, in my apartment on campus just after the first week of class. Um, Veronica was a little different than some of the other students. She wore all black and she always had a backwards baseball cap on. Um, she had these really intense eyes and she was very curious and very poetic. And she came to visit me. And one of the first things she said was, Amy, are you a Christian? Brian in the Backstreet Boys is a Christian. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh gosh, what a connection. <laughs> I know, right? This was 2003. She okay. was a huge fan of the Backstreet Boys. And um, she had read in an interview Brian talking. I think Brian went to like Cincinnati Bible College or something. And she heard him talking about that in an interview. And she didn't really know what it meant. Um, she thought since I was an American, I might know too. Um, I might know what Christianity really was or what it meant to be one. And so, you know, I thought that was hilarious. And we talked about it. I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And, you know, this is sort of what it means. And I just kind of dismissed that question as, you know, a question that was about pop music and crushes on boy bands. But Veronica actually kept coming back to me week after week with more questions about Christianity. And so eventually I, I told her I could give her a copy of the Gospel of Luke and we could read it together if she wanted to. And so we started doing that. Um, every week we would meet together and talk about the Gospel of Luke a few chapters at a time. And her interest turned out to be very sincere and and really very passionate. She would write me long letters um, because her was was not that great, and she felt more comfortable in written English than in spoken English. So sometimes she would write me long letters um, about her responses to what she was reading in the Bible. Um, quickly, she wanted more than just Luke, and so I gave her a Bible in her language, and she read most of Genesis. Uh, she read Ecclesiastes and some Psalms. She read Romans. Um, she was just kind of devouring the Bible. And how did how did she know? Um just wondering, even how did she have an interest in Christianity to begin with? I mean, clearly Holy Spirit was working, but like, how did she even know to look into that? Because it's it was you said there was not really a presence of Christians in the area. So, what kind of piqued your interest? Do you know? Honestly, all I know is the Backstreet Boys interview. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, I think that she was a person who was spiritually seeking. In general, you know, um, she had been through a lot in the past few years, um, a lot of personal struggles. And I think that that had sent her sort of on a spiritual quest to understand uh, what it meant to be human and who she was and what was her place in the world. And so when she kind of read Brian talking about Christianity, she thought maybe that held some answer for her. Um, yeah, she was a, natu a naturally, like, spiritually curious person, mm, okay. for sure. Um, so after we'd been studying the Bible together for a couple months, um, one day she said to me, this is true, isn't it? But, you know, at that point, I had never asked her, like, would you like to pray the prayer and receive Jesus into your heart? And there, there were reasons I hadn't. Oh, excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, where I was living, um, there was a cultural expectation that students would say yes to whatever their teachers asked of them. Teachers were very revered in that culture, very respected and honored. And so, for example, like if I asked some students if they wanted to come over and watch a movie at my apartment on Friday night, they would they would say, Mm, yes, yes, teacher, I think maybe we will. And that was like as close as they could come to saying no was to say yes, maybe. Sounds like what I do with um, my kids. Maybe we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, they couldn't say no because it would be too, like, culturally too rude. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't ask Veronica if she wanted to invite Jesus into her heart because culturally she would have to say yes, Right. I didn't have a way of asking her that um, that would leave her free to, like, give me an honest answer. So we had just been studying the Bible together. And one day she says, this is all true, isn't it? And I said, what? Like being cagey, trying to figure out what she really thought. 
And she said, Jesus really lived and really died and really rose again. Um, and then she said, this way of life is the most beautiful way of life I have ever heard of, but I am not good enough to receive it. Mm. And I was like, if you believe all of those things, you are already a part of the family of God. Like that's what it means to be a Christian is to believe that Jesus really lived it and really died and really rose again. And that that's a gift we're not good enough to receive. Like that's mm. basically the gospel. Well, like, <laughs> right. Just, and yeah. So she had, she had really come to that understanding just like through the Holy Spirit and through reading the scripture. And, um, so I told her like, you're already a part of the family of God if you believe this. And we both just like cried and laughed and, um, you know, it was amazing. Um, but from there, Veronica was filled with this desire to share the gospel with others. And, you know, this wasn't something that I encouraged her to do or told her that she needed to do as a new Christian. She just was like overflowing with the goodness of it all and couldn't stop talking about it. Um, so as a result of that, um, we had two more students who joined our Bible study. Um, eventually all three of them were baptized by some local believers in the capital city. Um, we had a couple more students and family members who were interested in studying the Bible with us. Um, Veronica was like writing letters to her friends from high school who went to different universities all over the country and like sending them passages of the Bible. Um, in fact, when I left for like our midwinter break, um, she asked if she could keep my copy of the Jesus film with her while I was gone. And I said, I warned her to be careful with it. But while I was gone, she showed it to her family and her parents. Um, her dad said he did not he did not believe in this. It was not true, but he wanted to watch it again. So he watched it again. And then he invited the neighbor to come over and watch it with him for the third time. And he and the neighbor agreed, like, this is not true. But the neighbor said, the people in my ancestral village have never heard this story and they should. And so he made a copy of the DVD and took it to his ancestral village and everybody there watched it. So like Veronica was just spreading the gospel. Um, wow. Yeah, it was, it, it was really, she was, she is a remarkable woman. Um, so at the end of that year, I was feeling like this is home. I could maybe spend the rest of my life here. I love this place. I love these people. And we have a little church that is being born right here. Um, it was like I, all your prayers were really answered. Yes. And like in miraculous ways that I never expected, you know, above and beyond, it was like, Oh, God is real after all <laughs> sort of a thing. Um, so yeah, it, it blew me away. And I prepared the girls to study the Bible, to kind of do their own Bible study church, whatever over the summer while I was back in the States taking some grad classes. And, um, and then I went back to the States, fully intending to return the next year. But while I was home for the summer, the police um, caught Veronica and her friends in Bible study and brought them into the police station and interrogated them and threatened them, confiscated their Bibles. They told them that they had to stop meeting together and talking about Jesus and that if they didn't stop they could be kicked out of university. Um, they might never be able to get jobs. Their families might lose their jobs. Was uh, there ever a threat of, and I wondered this when I was reading, is there ever a threat of like imprisonment or death or anything like that? Or is it just kind of was, and I don't even, I think from reading even the threats that they were given, I don't think they even had a right to do, but. Um, right. Um, you know, I don't know for sure everything that happened in the police station. I don't think that they made threats um, like that. Although when I read news reports from this country, I, I definitely read about Christians being imprisoned. So, um, so I think that even if that wasn't directly threatened, it's a, it's a threat that existed, right? Okay. Um, that exists in this part of the country. Um, yeah, so kind of through that interrogation, the students, um, with the students, the police found out that they had gotten their Bibles from me, and so the police ordered the university not to allow me to return to teach. Um, the university didn't actually tell me that until 
about a week before I was set to fly back. So um, although I knew all this was happening with the girls, it kind of happened at the beginning of the summer and then things quieted down. And I thought it was going to be fine for me to go back. Um, but then a week or two before I was supposed to go back, the university emailed me and said, due to curriculum changes, they would not be able to renew my teaching contract. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my faith was already in a bit of a tailspin just in seeing the girls because it was like all my prayers had been answered that first year. And then suddenly none of my prayers were being answered. And I couldn't understand why God had let these these young women, these baby Christians face such intense um, persecution. And, you know, the way that the police had interrogated them individually had kind of broken their faith in each other as well. So it was like um, everything had been snatched from them. Um, and while I, you know, as for as long as I thought that I could go back and maybe we could rebuild some things when I went back, um, I could kind of keep going. And then when I found out I couldn't go back, I, my faith just really began to tailspin and I couldn't understand why God would answer all those prayers in the beginning. And then suddenly it seemed God was silent and God was gone and I didn't know what to do next. Mm, yeah, that, that is heartbreaking for you to experience that and then just have it taken from you. It's like, you know, God, there's nobody to disciple them. Like, you know, I need to be back there. You know, you need to put me back there. Um, I can imagine yeah. the questions that you had. Yeah, so I wasn't sure at all what to do, but um, my organization was able to place me in a university in Cambodia for the following year. And Cambodia is an open country. Um, it's not forbidden to practice Christianity there. In fact, there's a vibrant indigenous Cambodian church um, and so I went to Cambodia and was doing the same thing, teaching English at a university. And, um, and in theory, also going to make disciples or to, you know, be investing in young Cambodian people, young Cambodian believers. Um, but honestly, I was just, uh, I was scared. You know, I had, I had trusted God and done what God had what I thought God had called me to do in that first year. And it had not worked out the way that I um, had expected. And, you know, it had caused a lot of hurt for people who I loved for Veronica. Um, so I was kind of afraid to try that again in Cambodia. I didn't want to hurt people. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I could trust God um, to answer my prayers in a way that would make sense. Um, so this is all the story that I tell in the book. And, you know, in the second half of the book, there's a lot of wrestling that I do with um, with some of those questions of what it really means to serve God, of what it means to be committed or surrendered. And if those are the same thing or if there's something different and um and really, you know, part of my goal in telling this story and in telling the story of kind of faith taking flight and then ending in a tailspin crash and burn is um, because I think that we don't hear these stories very often from missionaries. And yet I think that they happen all the time. And um, churches don't know how to support missionaries. Missionaries often feel like they can't be honest with their struggles because then they'll lose their financial support. Um, and and then we just end up sort of perpetuating this story of like missionaries as super spiritual heroes who always triumph. Um, and that does damage, you know, on a number of levels. Well, I think when I look at your story and, and the part that you explore in the second half of the book, there was a couple kind of themes that I thought were so important to talk about. And one is the idea of this, um, you know, making a big difference versus, I mean, a small difference, you know, kind of we were talking about like the, the missionary being the, you know, the top of the chain type thing versus, you know, in the middle of Indiana, can you make a, a difference? Hmm. And is it being making a difference even important? <laughs> so yeah. I, I'd love if like kind of you'd share a couple of your conclusions about that. 
Yeah, definitely. I think um, one thing I realized is that the Bible never actually calls us to make a difference. You know, um, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, try to be the salt of the earth. <laughs> Go out there and be the salt of the earth. He says, it's who you are. It's the very identity you've been given. So it's not about striving. It's about being. Um, it's it's about the identity that that we have as the Holy Spirit indwells us. Um, and I think when I once I came back from the from um, Cambodia, I I a couple years afterwards I was working in a Christian private high school, and I started to really struggle with what I was doing there. And I thought, how can this be as important as what I did in Southeast Asia? Because I'm working with all of these rich white kids. There is a church like there are 10 churches within a two mile radius. You know, there is all around them if they need it. And um, this does not seem like a big or important thing for me to be doing. And I think as I wrestled with that question, what I came to see was that um, we really have no way of knowing what is a big thing for God or what is a small thing for God. And God has not actually asked us to do big things. Um, God has asked us to um, accept our identity as God's beloved and to sort of let that love um, flow through us, right? Um, I think if we look at scripture, we see that we have no way of knowing what is a big thing for the kingdom or what is a small thing for the kingdom. Um, Jesus uh, says to his disciples that the widow's might is worth more than what anyone else is giving. What looks small to us is big to God. Um, Jesus says the last will be first and the first will be last. You know, so I think that it's quite clear in scripture that we don't know what's big for the kingdom or what's small for the kingdom, but we are asked to be faithful in what is given to us, right? And yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I just, and I, I'm glad you brought up that particular question that you are struggling with as a teacher in America. And I just love the idea of you, you know, helping that child who's going through a divorce, helping mm -hmm. them know their identity and helping the, them know that they have a God that's traveling through that with them. And, you know, God cares, you know, as much about that child as, as he does the one in Southeast Asia. And I think that was such um, a beautiful perspective and you shared mm. a quote, um, and I let me see if I can find it. Um, From St. John of the Cross? Yes, and I just found it. It said um, that our mission is to put love where love is not. Yeah. And it makes me tear up just even saying that. I wept when I read that in the book. Oh. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to cry. <laughs> but that is such, because I think it just harkens back to God's you know what he tells us to do love God and love others mm -hmm. and that we're just to put, supposed to put love where love is not and there's so many places where that is mm -hmm. and I think yeah. I think for real um, that just that phrase in your book really did finally demolish kind of my <laughs> idea of that you know mission work in a foreign country is like the thing you know and that when I'm putting love in my kid's life and, you know, mm -hmm. my neighbor's life, that that's just as important. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't mean that we we don't still wrestle with some of those questions of uh, what are we supposed to how can we fight injustice on a global scale? Um, you know. How do we keep working for um, for justice on Earth? We still have to wrestle with those questions, but we do get freedom from the savior complex. We do get freedom from the sense that we need to be the heroes of heaven. Nope. We're just the beloved of God. And I also, I, I just got to read, I just have to read a, um, a section here of your book. Uh, I just so relate to, I'm a, I don't know if you do Enneagram, but I'm like stuck in the Enneagram lately, but it's the whole personality typing system. And yeah, I'm, yeah, I know it. I'm okay. a five. <laughs> You're a five. I'm a three. I'm the achiever. Um, and so that's just personally something that I've been wrestling through. Uh, but this whole idea of being, again, doing big things and being useful to God. Um, 
And I love you said, I had to learn the feeling of God's absence to be able to recognize and appreciate his presence. I had to be a faithless servant before I could believe that God's love for me was not predicated on my usefulness to him. I had to learn that answers didn't satisfy before I could experience the relationship that does. And that just is something I just so could identify with that I've learned, you know, over the last, I don't know how many years, but it's just that it's not about our usefulness. <laughs> you know, it really yeah. is about us learning and leaning into the, into the idea of being God's beloved. Yeah. And it's not that we don't do useful things, <laughs> right. you know, out of that, but we do have to settle into this idea of being God's beloved. And one, I wanted to ask you, one of the things that you say about, I do think people are called to other countries and I don't want to, um, I don't want to belittle that or, or make that sound, you know, that's not what we're supposed to do. Cause I do think people are, are called all across the world and, and to leave home. Um, and so there's, there might be people listening that are being called to that. And I want to encourage people on that. Um, but you say that y- they should do it out of being God's beloved. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm going to question you here just a little bit though. Do you think that you could have gotten to that without going like so if you had taken your own advice and waited to your god's beloved do you think that (laughs) you could have done that you know i think that there are a lot of things that we gain from going overseas right um and so we can frame our work overseas as something that is uh, a heroic thing we're doing for those people over there um and that I think that's the problem, right? Is I felt I was going to do this like heroic thing for, for someone over there. Um, and actually that's how I came to understand what it really meant to be beloved of God. So it was like, actually that whole experience was, um, something that was more about my, maybe not, I shouldn't say more, but it was as much about my own spiritual growth as it was about the spiritual growth of anyone else. Um, and, and this is something I get into a little bit in the book when we're talking about short term trips, because even, you know, 50 years ago, a 10 month trip uh, would have been considered a short term trip. And I think it's really important that we think about the words we use when we talk about our short term trips. How do we frame what we're doing? And I think in a lot of ways, the short term trips, most of the short term trips that Americans are now are more about our own spiritual growth than about actually providing a needed service in the most like fiscally responsible way in another place. Um, and, and so I would really like to see us think more carefully about the way that we talk about the trips that we take. Um, if we called them vision trips or if uh, we recognized that there's like this reciprocal thing happening instead of framing them as like, we're going to take the love of God into this dark place when, you know, God's love is already there. God, God is everywhere. We're not taking God there. God is at work there. So why don't we say we are going to learn about how God is working in this part of the country and open up a dialogue and, Um, You know, one of the bishops of Kampala, when asked, like, what would you like Americans to do when they come to visit you? He said, why not just come and bring greetings? Like, let's open up this reciprocal conversation, because then when you're in relationship with somebody, it changes everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, I think I've gone in a different direction with that question than you were wanting. But um, no, it's good, because I think we have to think about, you know, people who are thinking about doing something like that to make sure they're in the right kind of frame of mind and and with the right goals. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that there are some people who should go overseas. And I think if you have the desire in your heart to go overseas, pay attention to that desire. Um, It may be, maybe was put there by God. And I think it's great to go, but I think that you should go with full recognition of like maybe your own mixed motives um, and with a humility, um, recognizing that you need to go as a learner. Um, you need to go knowing that you don't totally understand every situation, especially when you're working cross-culturally. And you need to not go out of this desire to achieve or to be heroic, but um, 
go because you want to learn to love the world and you know that you are loved. That's such good advice. Um, I would love to know about, you know, how you approach your faith and kind of living out your faith where you are today compared to yeah. sort of your goals as they were back then. And maybe for some of us who aren't called, you know, into mm -hmm. some other culture, um, how we can approach our everyday life, you know, with our faith in flight. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that, you know, that question is a little bit different for each person, but as you've already said quite el eloquently, putting love where love is not looks, um, can, can look a lot of ways. Uh, for me right now, I think a big part of my vocation is, is to help Christians and maybe particularly younger Christians use their words well. And so that's something that is kind of consistent across the different things that I do in my life, whether I'm teaching or writing or even parenting. Um, I'm really asking people to think about their words, um, to rethink sort of scripture and maybe and and maybe the Christianese that we use all the time about calling or about missions or you know doing big things for God, living radically. I'm really called to add, to help people think about those words that they're using um, and to make sure that they're using them wisely. And so I do that, you know, by helping my children. Um, come to an understanding of who they are, their identity in Christ. I do that with the students here on campus that I'm mentoring and discipling now. You know, we get, I have some students I try to get together with every week and we, um, we'll read things together and we'll talk about them and we'll try to move beyond some of just the cliches, the Christian cliches, um, and, and really get to the heart of the matter. So, I think that's kind of what the calling looks like for me right now. Mm. So good. I just love that reminder again to put love where the love is not. I think that's definitely um, something that's going to stay with me for a long time. Okay. Well, um, I've so enjoyed our time together. Um, if people want to connect with you, find the book, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the book is for sale everywhere. You can find it on Amazon or uh, hopefully at your local bookstore. I have a blog that I update very rarely, but it's at amypeterson.net. You can also find me quite a bit more often on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Amy L. Peterson. Um, that's A-M-Y-L as in love, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. All right. Well, I hope people connect with you and um, see what's going on, see what's going on with you and pick up the book. So thanks again so much for being with me, Amy. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Amy. Our conversation encouraged me in so many ways, and I hope it did the same for you. At first, my heart just goes out to people really across the world that are being persecuted for their faith, and they don't have the same freedom of religion um, that at least those of us in America are enjoying. You know, this episode is coming out Memorial Day week, so it's just an issue that is close to the surface right now for me, and I'm just so grateful for the freedom that we enjoy, and we just need to pray so hard for uh, the people that are being persecuted and... Um, you know, maybe they don't have the Bibles or have the teachers uh, to, to disciple them or even share the gospel with them um, in their faith. So, you know, I am so, um, though, encouraged by God's movement. You know, clearly he is at work, you know, even through small witnesses like the Backstreet Boys um, that was in this case or, you know, really the people that are um, being moved to go, people like Amy that have been moved to uh, go and share the gospel across the world and help um people who don't know Christ along in their journey. You know, but I am also so encouraged by the reminder that our job, whether we are called to go or whether we are called to stay, is to put love where love is not. I have said that so many times to myself since reading the book, how can I put love in this situation I'm in at this exact moment? You know, that truly is living the life of the beloved, being loved unconditionally by a Savior and then letting that love flow through us wherever our feet happen to be planted in the moment. All right, guys, I hope that encouraged you so much. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I want to remind you that you can find show notes over at abidingministries.net and then you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Abiding Ministries. 
Guys, thank you so much for listening this week, and we will see you next week on Feathers.